All right. Hello, everybody. We are live today here on Twitch with DocumentDB from the dining table. I'm your host, Chad Tindall. I'm a senior NoSQL Solutions architect here at AWS, and I'm joined by my co-host, Joe. Hey, Joe, folks. You introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Joe Edzorek. I lead product for Amazon DocumentDB. All right. Thanks for coming back. This is episode three of Document DB from the dining table. And we're here to talk about some recent product releases and go over some schema design ideas and principles. We'll talk about some uh, behind the scenes of uh, one of our support tickets and, and what happened there and how to avoid uh, that problem in the future for anybody who runs into something like that. And uh, let's dive right in. Hold on. Let me well, share what, my screen. what about sponsors? Oh, yeah. Today. Well, that's 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 kind of the next thing. Yeah, as everybody knows here, our frequent viewers, we are we are sponsored by the TV show Cobra Kai, and Miyagi Do. Uh, <laughs> Miyagi Do. Yeah, <laughs> Miyagi Do Karate. All right, you got All that right. one we for got, you. <laughs> we got a little craziness going on here. Uh oh, that's a good Could surprise, be. Joe. I like it. it. At least, at least we're not sponsored by LaRusso Auto. I mean, oh man, well, you know, but I, you could get like your own little bonsai tree if we were. That's next on my list. That was the next thing I'm going to buy. So I got this for you, Chad. I love it, Joe. I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> I know you want to talk about some product releases. I do. I, I have a, I have a release I'd like to talk about first. Uh, you you right. may or may not know this, but there is a, a Cobra Kai video game just launched this week on Xbox, PS4, and Nintendo <laughs> Switch. So, Very uh, fun. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to playing it. I've, I've ordered my copy and uh, should be good. I'll watch you. I'll watch you do it on Twitch then. <laughs> well, we're actually going to use Twitch for playing games. That's crazy. We should. Huh? It'd be a special episode. <laughs> special episode. I love it. I love it. I don't know how to use Twitch for PlayStation games though. I did it for, for PC. Maybe we can figure some out. Maybe we can figure <laughs> something out. All right. Well, let's, let's dive right in here. You know, for our new viewers who have never joined us before, we always start with just a brief overview of DocumentDB. If you've never heard of DocumentDB, it is a fast, scalable, fully managed. Mongo to be compatible database service on AWS. It can handle millions of requests per second. Uh, we do separate compute and storage so you can scale them independently. Uh, so you could have a small cluster uh, with large amounts of data without having tons of servers or anything behind the background. And, uh, but if you need to scale out and handle millions of requests per second, you can scale out to uh, 15 read replicas behind the scenes. It's fully managed. So you don't have to deal with hardware provisioning, uh, OS patching, uh, dealing with backups yourself. It's all sort of handled by the service and it is Mongo to be compatible with the 3.6 API. All right. Joe, anything you want to add there? Nailed it, Chad. Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. Feel free to ask us questions in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and, uh, and we'll pop them up and, and talk about them as the questions come in. We love your questions. And if there's any questions we can't get to for some reason, of course, we do have a segment where we handle unanswered questions from the previous episode. So we'll be doing that shortly. Um, if you want to know more about DocumentDB, uh, we have a number of recordings from last year's reInvent sessions about deep diving into DocumentDB, migrating your database to DocumentDB, some hands-on workshops. You can hear our leaders talking about it. We'll post these slides in the YouTube channel. Uh, and if you want, you can, or you can just Google document DB uh, reinvent 2019. You'll find the, the blog post that's referenced here that has links to all of these uh, presentations. And so you can go learn more about document DB, but the purpose of this channel is to uh, dive deep. And so here we go. All right. I'll let Joe talk about the recent product releases. We'll do it. Chad, we have the we'll be starting shortly banner still going. Um, I thought I turned it off. I'm sorry. That's I okay. We, that's fine. We'll... Oh, I turned it off and turned it back down by accident. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> no worries. All right. So we had some pretty good launches recently. A um, few of the things, and these have been some longtime customer asks. We're always excited to get those ones out the door. Uh, we added support for um, increased retention for change streams. So you can now increase change streams retention from 24 hours now up to seven days. Uh, we also added the ability in, in, in Document DB to be able to watch uh, a change stream or open a cursor on a change stream at the cluster level. So all collections, all databases in the cluster or at the database level. So previously it was just at the collection level. So now it's uh, at much liar, you know, higher levels of, of, of abstraction within the database. Um, which can be super useful if you want to say, hey, I want to replicate all changes from this, this particular database to 
S3 or Elasticsearch, wherever you want to bring that data. So that's super useful. Um, that, are, are people also using that to, to replicate to like a document DB source in another region or something like that? We do, you know, we do see, you know, we do see, uh, we do see that pattern. Um, and, and sometimes we see it across accounts, you know, folks who say, hey, I want to replicate this stream across accounts, or uh, they want to implement cross region replication across different, um, across different regions as well. Um, we should probably just build that feature, huh? Uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to lead a horse to water here or anything, but that's a, that's a good observation. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's that that one just launched. That was a, that was a goodie, um, and then uh, some fun stuff with their friends in in DMS land. Uh, DMS added support now for parallel load um, for moving data between databases. So, so if you're doing a migration with DMS, before it was single threaded. So if you did the full load portion of a migration. And you had lots of data. Uh, we would, uh, we would. It can take a long time. Uh, so we added parallel load support now, so it's able to partition data and load in parallel to to help that first bulk load phase of a migration speed up much much quicker. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Faster is better. Um, and we also added the ability to uh, use Document DB three six as a DMS source. Um, so this is really useful for folks that want to uh, be able to replicate, but use DMS to replicate between document DB clusters. Uh, we have a number of customers that use, you know, DMS not just for, for migrations, uh, but also for, you know, those types of scenarios where they want to put it data into S3 or, you know, wherever they might go. It also lets you, you know, like, it, you know, and this is what we're, we're also really excited about with, with 3.6 is you can use the same tools to migrate onto Document DB if to migrate off of Document DB. We want to be able to provide both both streams so that we have to earn, you, you know, your business and trust every day. So really excited to get that out. Some of the if you can imagine some of the work that we did at Change Streams helped us enable uh, this work with with DMS, and uh, looking forward to to getting folks' feedback. You know, one of the things that we've talked about on this show, and of course in many other presentations, is the need to do a Mongo dump and Mongo restore before you start replicating. So, does the parallelization of DMS mean that we don't need to do that anymore? It gets us a lot further down the path. I mean, I think um, you know it. it, it you know, especially for things around you know 500G to one one terabyte. Like I think we're we're a much better situation now. And and Chad, why we typically you know why this matters for customers is if you have to increase the uplog on your source MongoDB cluster, time matters, right? Because as, as time goes on, you know, from when you do that uh, when you do that full load. Um, it can actually increase the disk size pretty significantly. So you know, we 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 still. Uh, we still have room to improve performance, but I think it, it brings us a lot further down the path of, of being able to handle much larger workloads uh, for being able to do use DMS for that bulk load versus like say Mongo dump uh, and Mongo restore. So you would say if you had more than a terabyte of data, you still would go the Mongo dump, Mongo restore route, but less than that, you could go the DMS full load. That Yeah, exactly. Yep, I'd still look at the parallel. Um, I, I still think we have room to improve parallelization. Um, and, and I think you know Mongo dump and Mongo restore are really great utilities. Um, and and you know, and we have some good. I'll actually throw some stuff in the documentation on how to ex, you know how to best utilize the parallelization in those tools as well. Um, so definitely room for improvement, but definitely a huge step up of you know I think we're seeing you know three to four times as much performance depending on the scenario uh, for DMS full load. So you know something that you know previously would have taken an hour now takes fifteen minutes. So it, that's uh, We'll take it. Incremental yeah, progress. Absolutely. No, that's great progress. Absolutely. Chad, I also got this for you as well, too. Oh, strike first, strike hard, no mercy. I love it. Sp I um, love it. Spending up, I spent all my allowance this week on both of these items. Well, that's money well spent as far as I'm concerned. That's true. So yeah, so, so so some good launches. Uh, you know, we are in in pre-event season, so it's definitely definitely some more stuff coming out between now and then that we're really excited about. So definitely stay tuned, and uh, we'll be looking about looking forward to talking about that on on future shows coming up very very soon. Good. I think it's safe to say there's some really big launches that we'll be discussing on our next episode. I think so. I hope so. I really good. do. <laughs> good. 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 All right, thanks. Well, let's uh, let's go. You know, we don't duck the hard questions here. Someone asked us a question, we're going to answer it. It just happened that this question came up at the very end, and we had to end the stream. But 
Uh, we had a user, why is Bob not allowed, who asked, uh, what is the effect of layers on cold start and environment reuse? Well, if you uh, were here for episode two, two weeks ago, one of the things that one of our other solution architects, Brian Hess, presented was a way to package up the document DB dependencies that are needed for programming languages like, say, Python or Node.js into a DynamoDB layer. And the advantage of doing that is that um, you don't have to build a zip file, build them into your zip file with your Lambda function and, uh, and upload them. You can, if you have a layer, that means that you can write the code that interacts with DocumentDB directly from the Lambda console, which is very nice. And someone asked, uh, yeah, basically, what, what's the effect of this layer when it comes to cold starts and things like that? So I took this to the product manager for Lambda layers. And what he told me is that layers are, they're just a packaging mechanism for third-party libraries. And ultimately, they are packaged with your function uh, at compile and invoke time. So when you change a layer, it's really no different than changing your function as far as cold starts are concerned. All right. It's just, you know, it's just a, it's a nicer way of packaging things up. But behind the scenes, uh, as far as Lambda is concerned, uh, it, looks, it looks the same. All right. So that was our only unanswered question. Yeah, I want to spend some time today talking about schema design principles. And we get a lot of questions like this from customers who are moving from relational to document DB or, uh, or are just new to working with NoSQL databases and have a new application. And they're not quite sure, you know, what to do, how to do things right. And <laughs> so today I want to talk about denormalization for optimizing read times. Because one of the things people say is that well, they go read, the, you know, they go read some blog posts, they go read some documentation pages. They go, oh, NoSQL is all about denormalizing. I have to take all my data and all my relationships and denormalize it. And wow, that's so easy to do in DocumentDB because I can just have arrays of objects nested inside of other objects. So it's it's easy to go crazy with the denormalization in a way that is suboptimal. And you, you really don't want to, uh, you know, I, I say here, third normal form is for the week. Of course, since they crease <laughs> telling us, but I do not think necessarily third normal form is for the week. I don't agree with that 100%. I do think that denormalization is great, but you really only want to denormalize as much information as you need to provide the necessary results. So what you want to avoid is, um, you know, doing application side joins in the middle of, a, of an API call. All right. So, you you know, so if you have and I want to look at I'm, I'm going to pull up IMDB in a second and and we'll just talk about an example of how we would go through designing a schema for something like IMDB. But what you want to avoid is saying, oh, well, I need to uh, I need to query this movie object and then I need to go query do separate queries for each of the user objects. So each of the actor objects that are inside of a movie and then I need to do separate queries for. I don't know, you know, things like news articles that I want to put on the side of IMDb. I don't want to do separate queries for each one of those things. I want to denormalize enough that I can satisfy what I need to do with one query, but I don't want to denormalize at all. So let's let's just go pull up an IMDb page and see if we can talk through an example here. All right, Joe. What should we pull up the greatest movie of all time? The Bridges of Ma one. The Bridges of Madison County. I mean, I know you're a Clint Eastwood fan, but I think I think let's stick with Karate Kid because <laughs> we all Kid. know it's a safe that, bet. Uh, for those I think that's a consent. The 80s. This a consensus one, I, vote. I think for me that it's kind of a tie between this one and Top Gun. Ooh, okay. Chad, did we did we just become best friends again? Again. <laughs> again i love right. top gun oh totally totally i'm so excited for the uh sequel to come out all right so you know when we pull up a movie we can imagine that we would model a movie object in document db and that movie object of course would contain the name of the movie the year it came out uh we we might have oops i didn't mean to click that 
back up. Okay, it backed up too far. So it's going to have the name of the movie, the year the movie came out. We might have a little array of all the um, of all the genres that the movie's in. Okay, little little arrays are fine in Document DB, um, and of course, movies have actors. And so we're going to want to have some information about the actors, but we don't need all the information about the actors. All we need uh, for each actor, we need the name of the actor. We need the character's name that they played in the movie and maybe a link to the actor's, uh, you know, thumbnail photo or something like that. And so when I'm displaying a movie, that's all I have here. But if I, if I were to click on this link, okay, it's going to take me to the actor's page and every actor has a, unique identifier here so that's the other thing i'm going to need to put with each movie i'm going to have an array of actors it's going to have the name of the actor the character name and then the actor's unique id which allows me to generate a link that i can then link over to the actor's detail page that's it right actors have a ton of information if i look at the actor page you know um there's a bio for the actor is the date he was born if he's dead the day he was died what city he was born in you know, every movie he made, uh, all this stuff that's related to an actor, whether he was an act, whether he was an actor, a, a producer, director, writer, worked on the soundtrack, all this stuff. We don't need to denormalize all of this information into the movie object. We just need to do a partial denormalization so that we can satisfy the query and render this page as quickly as possible you know, in one query. And the same thing over here, you know, for, for every actor, it's going to have an array of movies and our TV shows the, you know, that they were in or whatever. And we don't need to normalize all the information about those movies or TV shows either. Just the name, you know, if it's a TV show, what, you know, what years it came out, what episodes that that actor was in and, and, you know, just, just a little bit of information there. So I think so it's really. So you're saying we don't have to put everything in one single document. Absolutely not. I think it's totally reasonable to still have some amount of normalization in a, in a non-relational database. You know, we call it non-relational because it's we don't use SQL to query it, but um, it's totally reasonable to have some relationships here. And we just want to avoid having to do client-side joins as much as possible you know, because these NoSQL databases don't support joins. But other than that, you know, denormalize what you need to denormalize and, um, and have some optimization there. Well, we do have this handy thing in document to be called dollar lookup stage where we can do the left outer join. Yeah, you can do some joins there. Um, but I don't know that you'd want to do that across a data set that had, you know, 50 terabytes of data. Right? No, uh, we, you know, yeah, we definitely, uh, yeah, that's, this we're understanding how your data is referenced between your, your, um, your primary and foreign collections and being able to stand how much data you're going to be sifting through and understanding what that query plan looks like. Um, oftentimes it's better just to have, just be able to do a quick find to be able to pull back a single document versus having to do complex joins or trying to get both client side and, and service side, trying to avoid that whenever possible. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about a, an API call that you want to return very quickly because right. you're going to render a web page with it. That's right. I think it's different if you're talking about, uh, you know, some back end analytics job that's doing some large batch processing or something like that that could run for hours anyway. And nobody's waiting for the response to, to see their Web page. That's right. You know? So so when, when you're talking about something that needs to be returned with low latency, you know, finding something in just a single document is really what you want to shoot for. All right. Third normal form is not. The <laughs> <laughs> now. We do want to avoid some common pitfalls here as we design our documents. And one of the biggest pitfalls I see customers do is, is an ever growing array, an array that just grows forever. You know, we talked about the fact that it's so easy to put things into arrays in document DB and it, it so naturally models the way we deal with objects in our object oriented programming languages. Oh, we got this array. We'll just keep adding things to it. But if you let, and, and, and that's easy to do when you're just creating an application you know, you're doing rapid prototyping, you're trying to get something out to, to your end user and get some feedback and, and evolve very quickly. And uh, so that's fine. If that's what you're going to do. But you have to realize that eventually, if you let an array grow forever, it will consume the entire 16 megabit uh, megabyte document size. And uh, so you'll run out of space at some point uh, after your, your app is running for long enough. 
And the other thing you want to keep in mind is that when you change even just a single field uh, in a document, the database is rewriting that whole document every time. So even if you, so, if you have a 15 megabyte document because you have a massive array with hundreds of thousands of entries in it, and you just add like one more item to that array, you think, oh, I'm just adding one more item. It's not a big change. But really on the back end, you're rewriting that 15 megabytes every time. You're incurring IOs to write that 15 megabytes every time. And same thing when you want to read that document, you're going to incur IOs to read that 15 megabytes every time. So it's not something that you want to, uh, I mean, it's really kind of a, an anti-pattern having arrays that grow forever, right? So having arrays that are short, like we talked about uh, genres for a movie, you know, any movie, you know, it might have a, a handful of genres, three, four, five, something like that, but it's not going to grow forever. And uh, it's not going to have a lot in it anyway. And same thing with like a restaurant might have a category, you know, it might be a, it might be a Spanish restaurant, might be a tapas restaurant with cocktails and be a cocktail bar. So, you know, restaurants might have a few categories as well, um, but it's not going to grow forever. Right. It's not going to be a huge array. So that kind of usage of arrays is really nice. Um, so, you know, one bad example that uh, I've actually seen in real life was an e-commerce site and they had an object representing the user that, you know, this is obviously, I'm paraphrasing here what the object looks like, but there was some login information. The user had some shipping addresses, a handful of an array for payment options. You know, you might have three, four, seven or eight credit cards if you're me, you know, uh, my Amazon account. But uh, you also need a place where you want to store the user's order history because you want to be able to show the user what their recent orders were. But if you were to say, well, I'm just going to take every order that that user had and put it into the order history array of the user object. Well, you know, especially for a long, you know, Amazon has been around for over 20 years. You know, we have a lot of order histories. And if you just look at my last year, I probably have hundreds of orders just from the last year. Uh, we're always getting stuff delivered. So, you know, I, you don't want to have an array that just grows forever like this with the order history just to satisfy the most common query, which is show me my recent orders. You know, it's fairly uncommon that I go back and look at orders that I did years ago, but it's much more common that I look at orders that I did in the last you know week or two. Maybe because I want to see if the, sh where it's, you know, is the shipping going on or maybe I need to do a return, something like that of a recent thing that I received. So, so what we actually want to do is separate these uh, objects and have a user object and have an order object and actually have a different collection that we store your complete order history in with one document for each order. All right. Um, of course, that document would relate back to the user object. So here we have some normalization going on. Um, not necessarily third normal form. I guess actually in this case it is third normal form, but um, doesn't have to be. Uh, but we so we're going to have a document for every order and put that into an order history collection. But we also want to store the, ten, let's say, the five or 10 most recent orders in the user object. That way, when we query your user object to show you your page, we can just show you what your most recent orders were, uh, or just give you a list even uh, of what your most recent orders were. And, um, and we'll just keep the 10 most recent ones in there all the time. What do you think, Joe? Is that a good design? Well, it, you know, there's some there's some things I'm kind of thinking about here. Um, you know, one is how do you keep those, you know, those two collections, you know, up to date? Um, you know, you want to make sure that if you do insert something into your orders table that you you insert it into that recent orders table as well. Um, definitely helps cut down. I mean, the, we've definitely seen many cases of this on this bounded array size. Um, and, you know, the other tricky thing here is that, you know, a lot of times people want to index this array. So then the index of the array, you know, gets enormous and that needs to fit in memory um, and it kind of cascades. So, um, you know, definitely could help. Definitely de definitely better than putting all the, the orders in there. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like uh, you, you want to try to satisfy your pages with one query. So if you have a page that's going to show some user information and recent orders, now I can just query the user object and get the most recent orders with one query. And I'm not going to be overloading uh, the system by having a massive user object that just grows forever. That's right. right? So the way that we do that is uh, we utilize the push operator on arrays with the slice operator. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a new item onto the array, which is our new order. But we're also going to slice off the, the first item, which is our oldest order. And so at, 
that, it, you know, if we want to keep 10, we're just going to use slice with the minus 10 index, uh, like you see down there at the bottom. And, you know, maybe that's five or three or whatever you want, but whatever number you put there, that's how many items are going to be in the array when you're done. And this is how you uh, push something on and pop off the oldest in an uh, atomic way. Pretty slick. Very nice. Super easy to do. It's a nice little pattern. And, uh, and we see it used all the time for all kinds of different things. Uh, so good. All right. So we next uh, segment here. Come on. All right. We're going to talk about some learnings from behind the scenes. So we have a customer who opened a support ticket. They were reporting some unexplained high read IOPS during times when their application really didn't have high read usage. They were just not sure what was going on there. Okay. So, you know, we dove into that and uh, we looked at the customer's cluster. They had eight indexes on this cluster, which isn't an outlandish number. You know, it's definitely on the high side, but it's not like, oh, whoa, you have eight indexes. Like, what are you doing? That's crazy. Uh, but we did want to you sort of dive into that a little deeper and see, you know, what's going on in terms of the amount of data in the collection and in the indexes. It turned out the collection had 500 gigs of data, but the indexes had a terabyte of data. So the indexes were twice as big as their, as their data set, which is, you know, that's, that's fine if you have a very heavy read use case and you need that many indexes, but it does have an impact on operations because you really want to make sure that your indexes fit into RAM, uh, and so the larger indexes you have, the, that means you need bigger indexes. I'm sorry, bigger instances that have more RAM on them. Um, and so if that's what you need, great. But you also want to optimize for that. Uh, there's also this, um, you know, if you do a lot of deletes, which this customer did, there's this background garbage collection process that happens for reclaiming space of dead document versions. And sometimes that can require reading pages that aren't in the buffer cache and writing them back to disk, which is what was happening here. That's kind of where that unexplained read usage was coming from. You know, as it turned out, four of their indexes were completely unused. So they were using a lot of space, uh, consuming a lot of RAM for that. They were uh, consuming some read IOPS they didn't need to be consuming. And um, really part of uh, the fixing this problem was to go root out the fact that half their indexes were totally unused and, and remove them. So then the question, oh, hello, we have a new guest. Yeah, my, my son wanted to join the show and say hi for a second. He's trying to put on his socks to go to daycare. Oh, so well. Oh, they're mom's socks, but we just we just had a special guest want to say hi here. So hello. Such a cutie. Oh, gets his mother's looks. <laughs> oh yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Face for the radio, am I right? Absolutely. Should we I I wish I could just have your audio here. I don't know how to turn off your camera, but <laughs> oh no, so... no, no. That's part of the fun here on Twitch. Uh, so yeah, how do we detect indexes like this, which are unused? And it turns out it's actually pretty simple. Um, we do want to, uh, to 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 detect them and delete them. Um, you know, and the way sorry, I'll back up to this slide in a second. The way that we do that is by doing an aggregation function on the index stats. And when we do that, we can see how many accesses that index has had. Uh, you know, in 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 some period of time, and we can see, for example, that the second index that I have here has had zero accesses um, since uh, October 21st. So to me, that's a, that's a clue that I need to go back to the to the development team and say, hey, you guys have this index here. You haven't used it in you know a couple of weeks or whatever. It, has your app changed in a way that you have a you, that access pattern that we created this index for? You don't need it anymore. Can we delete this index? I wouldn't recommend just automating this process and detecting indexes that are unused and deleting them because maybe the app still needs them, um, you know, but it only needs it once a month or something like that. Yeah. And, and you want to avoid a table scan, but uh, definitely it's uh, gives you some data to take back to the application team and, and dive deeper. Yeah. And the other thing about indexes and like, you know, we, we definitely, you know, we see this a lot is, you know, every time you write to a collection, you have an index, you also have to write that value to the index as well. So if you have eight indexes, when you do a write to a collection, you're writing nine times. Um, so it definitely slows down your your inserts to your, your, you're creating, you know, you're creating a much larger storage footprint. And then when you need to read, um, you know, from, 
you need to read as well. You need to pull those indexes into memory. So especially on the right path, if you have unused indexes, it's 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 very beneficial to remove them um, as it's just a lot less work that the database has to do to persist a single document. Absolutely. You know, I mean, the, the whole point of an index is a trade off of saying we're, our rights are going to take longer and be more expensive because we have to do more of them behind the scenes for every change we do in the database uh, so that our reads will be faster. You know, we're trading off write speeds to speed up our reads. And, That's right. And storage size. I mean, there's just there's just no size. there's no free lunch. Like I think some sometimes the indexes kind of get this like it's a magic wand. We'll just create 19 indexes and everything is better. Um, but it, you know, it does create a lot more work for the database. There's no doubt about it. And this isn't unique to DocumentDB. I think this is kind of part and parcel for for all database systems. But it, there's 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 a cost. Absolutely. Yeah, this is true for all database systems. I mean, this is just how indexes work. Yep. Um, you know, so the other thing I want to bring up is not just looking at indexes, which are not used and deleting them because that's an easy, low hanging fruit type of win. But one of the things that we talk about in, uh, in our design sessions is not just what's your access pattern. Oh, I need to query on these fields. Okay. We'll add an index. How often do you do that access pattern? We don't just say, oh, let's, let's look at every query you have and make sure it's backed by an index. Usually that's what we'd want to do. But if you have an access pattern which only runs, say, once a day, <clears throat> it might not be worthwhile to have that served by an index. You might just say, oh, well, I have this batch job that runs once a day and it needs to look at you know, all, a huge amount of data. Um, maintaining an index is very costly, both in terms of disk space and IOPS and, and all this other stuff. And I need bigger instances to keep my indexes in RAM. It might make sense to say for this infrequently used access pattern, we're not going to have an index. We'll take the hit of doing a table scan, but it's something we only do once a day anyway. So, you know, and yeah. in the middle of the night or something when the application is not busy, and uh, that way it's actually cheaper uh, than having an, than maintaining an index all the time for a very infrequently used access pattern. That's correct, and and sometimes we see indexes that just have a low high card that have a low cardinality, which means they just have a low amount of unique values. So think true, false, or you know, a you know, status if, enum or something. Yeah, exactly. Where like the database isn't going to use the index anyways. It's actually be less performed for the database to use the index. So then it's actually there. <laughs> it's taking up space, but it's actually not beneficial to actually serving the query. So there is you know definitely examples of. You know, low cardinality indexes that that chew up resources and cost, and, and don't actually provide any additional value. Um, and and you know, so not all indexes are are guaranteed to be you know increased performance. Right. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a question. I want to go back to uh, to uh, was here. Someone asked. Uh, someone asked about two phase commits. I'm. Uh, you know, if you want to clarify your question a little bit, I'm not sure if you're asking whether the the push and the slice happens in the in the context of a of a commit or whether it's, you know there's a time where this the array has 11 items and then it has 10 after after we slice it. But the push and slice operator are atomic, so you would never see. It's not like you could do a read and see. Uh, oh, well, now I have 11 objects, and then you do a read again, you'll see 10. The push and the slice are going to happen in the context of a single operation under that atomic lock for updating the item. That's correct. Yeah, any single statement operation in DocumentDB is is atomic, um, whether it accesses one document or multiple documents. Right. Uh, if your question was about a two-phase commit for updating the orders collection and the users collection, um, uh, you know that's not something that's possible in the MongoDB 3.6 API. Uh, it is something that's possible in the MongoDB 4.0 API, which we don't support yet but may at some point in the future. Yeah, I don't know. Transactions seem pretty useful for databases, Chad. Transactions are very useful for databases. It would be awesome if those were supported uh, here in DocumentDB, and maybe they will be one day. You know, I don't know. I maybe guess. someday. Maybe we, someday. Should do. we should build that. I think we should build that. Yeah. Can you get on that? That <laughs> I'll, sounds so useful. Start, I'll start right after lunch. <laughs> Good. We'll be done by dinner. Yeah. All right. All right. So uh, let's see. There was another question about lazy index updates. Um, yeah, no, I mean this isn't. This just isn't how it works in in DocumentDB. Really, the indexes are going to get updated when you when you write the data, right? 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think about where 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 Will Phil's going with that one. Um, well, if I think about like a, a global secondary index in DynamoDB, you know, those indexes uh, are eventually consistent. Obviously, they happen <laughs> super quickly within milliseconds, but there is a moment in time between when you update an item in the table and when that update is reflected in the global secondary index. And you could, you, you know, you could update an item and then immediately read that index and not see the change reflected if you did it super sure. fast. Got it. All right. But yeah, so document that's, DB. That's just not the case here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, got it. Yeah, document DB like little little bit different is uh, you know indexes are updated are strongly consistent, so you won't see something in a collection that's not in an index. But if you do read from a replica, um, you will see eventual consistency just in that that kind of atomic unit of of an update. But you won't see an item in a collection that's not in an index. But you can see lag between the primary and the replica. So if you need read. Read after write consistency, then then reads from the primary eventual consistency from the replicas. Right. Well, that would be true even just reading from the base table, not using indexes, right? That's correct. That's right. All right. Good question, Phil. Index deserve no mercy. You know, if it's not getting used, it's gotta go. That's what Sensei right. Kreese told me. I'm looking forward to the the top gun themes. Like uh <laughs> we're gonna have to those will be good. I'll, Season two, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need all new uh, COVID masks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, yeah, that's uh that wraps up our show for today. And I, I did want to say that uh, normally we've been doing these every two weeks, but we do have a Document DB virtual workshop that's going to happen two weeks from today at this time. So our next episode won't be for another month in December. But there's information here. There's a link. Maybe Joe can paste this link into the chat. And uh, if you want to register for this document to be virtual workshop, it's going to be the same uh, bat time, same bat channel as this show. It's going to be two hours from uh, 8 to 10 Pacific, 11 to 1 Eastern time. And Joe has got this link. We just got a, we just got a humdinger of a question. Let's see. Oh, man. Wow. We get, well, good thing, <clears throat> good thing we have 20 minutes left in our slot here. <laughs> should, we get the, word. should we get the beer or the whiskey out to answer this one? <laughs> I might have to drop the whiskey into the beer, I think. <laughs> Can DocumentDB be used instead of DynamoDB for big data applications? Um, you know, here at Amazon, we, have, we talk about purpose-built databases, and we want you to use whatever database works best for your job. And uh, not just for the for the task, but also for inside of your organization, where your organization has expertise, all of that uh, is true as well. So I would say that, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the entire space of, of applications, I mean, this is the way I talk about it. Of course, we get this question all the time. Joe, I'd be curious to hear how you talk about it, too. But yep. when I get this question, what I say is, you know, if I imagine the entire universe of applications, some of them are best served by relational databases, of course. Uh, still, certainly, if you have to interact with some business intelligence applications that need to speak SQL and, and do all these complicated joins, you don't know what the access patterns are in advance. So, uh, you know, you can't design and denormalize your schema in a way that serves the access pattern more efficiently like you would in a NoSQL database. Yeah, use SQL databases for that. That's fine. Okay, what's left? Okay, well, I have analytics jobs. Well, we have special uh, analytics databases for that, uh, like Redshift or what have you. Okay, take those out. Now what's left? Well, I have OLTP applications that are left. And I can service those with relational databases. So certainly we've been doing that for a long time, but I can also service those with NoSQL non-relational databases. Mm -hmm. And and uh, of course, there's a number of different non-relational databases which would work fine. Um, I think there's obvious wins here if you have if you're running MongoDB on premise or something like that and looking for a cloud-hosted solution that's that you don't have to manage anymore. Then that's just you know you can you can migrate your application to Document DB. That should be very straightforward. It's the same drivers and same code and examples all that. Um, if you have an application which is huge and needs to handle, you know, millions of writes per second, all right, with something beyond which a, an instance of Document DB probably wouldn't be able to handle today, then DynamoDB is a clear right answer for that. We definitely have customers using DynamoDB that that do 10 million writes a second. 
you know, Amazon.com uses DynamoDB. And if you look at our stats from Prime Day, I think we peaked out at something like 80 million writes a second or something like that on DynamoDB, uh, just, just from Amazon's uh, usage of it. So, you know, it, operating at that scale, that's the, that's a clear right answer. But, you know, that's maybe like uh, only, you know, 10% of the, of the applications. For, for that middle ground, I think it's reasonable to say we could use either DocumentDB or DynamoDB, whatever you prefer inside of your uh, organization. I mean, that's the way I talk about it. Yeah, I think it's like Chad's absolutely right. I mean, we, we kind of look through these ones uh, and we kind of work backwards from what the use case is and say, hey, you know, like big data can be, you know, in the eyes of one customer can be 100 gigs in the eyes of another customer it can be, you know, 10 petabytes. Um, we're just going to say, okay, well, what is, you know, what does the data model look like? What are the types of access patterns um, that you have? And then we work backwards from that. And I think, you know, we have many databases for this very reason is because sometimes there's a very clear answer and, you know, we have a, you know, we have a database like DynamoDB, um, just the way that it's architected um, is, is super conducive to, you know, workloads like, um, you know, like a shopping cart for, for, you know, Amazon.com because of the way that it, it partitions data and can horizontally scale, that becomes a really good choice for that type of, of data model and access pattern. Um, you know, but then we see, you know, we see, you know, other use cases where you want to do some, you know, kind of like what, what Chad showed today with the, you know, with the slice um, and uh, the array operators where you want to handle some of that stuff in the database and that makes more sense for you and, and it's easier for you to develop and, and that might be a better use for document DB. Um, and, and the, the tough thing is, it's it's a hard answer without kind of going through um, without going through the use case. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, so I think that's where we kind of start. There is what is the access pattern? How are you going to query the data? Um, and then you know, what is the scale of the data as well? Um, and you know, what is what does that data model look like? And this is you know, you know, we look at across. You know, I think the tough thing sometimes is you. The answer could be many databases, and I think. Um, you know, you know, then it kind of becomes preference. And as Chad said, institutional knowledge, you know, what is the most of your developers know and, and folks kind of go forth from there. Um, and then sometimes as the application evolves, it becomes much clearer over time that, hey, I need X database. We've definitely seen folks, you know, implement a graph, you know, a graph API in their application layer. And then the data size becomes so untenable that they, they just can't even do that anymore. And then they're like, oh, well, let's use Amazon Neptune. Um, or they start using a regex query in document DB, but then their you know their their application evolves over time. So then they you know start to write their data through change streams to Elasticsearch, and then they can use a much more verbose you know um, you know fuzzy search API in Elasticsearch. So we see kind of these things evolve over time. What we're trying to do is give you the options so that you can choose what's right for you um, without having to be kind of shoehorned into a single database or a single data model. All right. Well, that was a great question coming from the chat. I love it. Thank you. But yeah, I mean, that's where Chad spends a you know a significant amount of his time is just kind of going through and kind of unraveling like, okay, let's take a look at your application. Um, you know, this is what a lot of the solution architects at AWS do to figure out what would be the best choice for you. And I, I think what I love about the solution architect role at DocumentDB is their their whole, or not document at AWS, is their whole role is to educate. Um, you know, like there's no, there's no variable comp based on, you know, there's no quota, there's no nothing. It's, it's just purely to educate. Um, and, and, you know, whether, you know, whether what, what solution is the right choice, you know, they don't really have, um, you know, a pigeon in the game to, so to speak, but they, they just want to make sure that the customers are successful. So I think, you know, definitely engaging with essays, you know, AWS wide, um, uh, is is such a great way to help answer some of these questions. If you have more specifics, I, we would love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Contact us offline, uh, and uh, certainly we can talk about your application and your needs. Yeah, Joe, you're absolutely right in terms of the SA role here. I mean, this is not really the point of this thing, but as an aside, you know, I've been an SA at other companies. I was an SA at Elasticsearch. I was an SA at MongoDB, Cloudera, Red Hat. Every single one of those, the SA role is kind of part of the sales organization and. And you know your part of your pay is based on you know, quotas and commissions and how much product you sell and all that, like a salesperson. And this is the first SA role I've ever even heard of where that's not true. You know, uh, we are not like I don't make more money if you buy DocumentDB instead of DynamoDB. You know, something like that. So uh, 
you know, the, the goal here is to do the right thing for the customer. And if the right thing is to use that database or that database or that database, you know, there's no ego in it. We're going to point you in the right direction for what's right for your use case every time. And yeah. so there, there's a high degree of trust, I think, there because of that. Because there's no like, are you just telling me this because you need to make your, you know, quota or something like that? It just doesn't happen here. It's not a thing. And, I love uh, and I love that part because it just has it just it just ends up at the right conversation and you, and you know sometimes we you know our friends in the sales team are like no no don't say that we're like hey yeah this is the customer obsessed thing to do this is the right thing for the customer they're going to be successful because of this um, and and I, I absolutely love it like it's it's so much fun getting on a phone with a solution architect and having to just educate the customer um, without pushing one thing or another like it's it's the best. All right, we did have another question come up because uh, you mentioned a red regex query. What's that? What's the use case? So, you know, we do have this uh, ability to query text fields in DocumentDB using a regular expression, um, which is fine, you know. But uh, and it can use an index in certain cases. You mm -hmm. know, if you're if you're looking at the leading the leading part of a string as opposed to sure. the middle or the end of a string, but um, you know, so 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 certain use cases that can be highly efficient. But other use cases, you know, where you want to search on strings in much more complicated ways, you want to do um, full text searches, you want to do auto completion, you know, where you start like on Google, you start typing a search and it suggests things that you want to do. Um, you know, if you want to do typo correction, oh, you to put this, but did you really mean that? You know, those things, those much more complicated string searches are better done in a specialized indexing system like Elasticsearch. And that's why in episode one of DocumentDB from the dining table, we showed how to replicate your data from DocumentDB to Elasticsearch so that you can do those much more complex queries on strings. That's right. And that's where kind of purpose, and this is kind of, you know, more dovetailing into our, you know, this is why we want to have multiple databases because like the whole Elasticsearch team is focused on being able to answer those questions and be able to handle those workloads really well. Um, and, and, you know, we, you know, my favorite thing is always like, I'll, I'll see something and I want to go buy it on Amazon and like, you know, I'm not typing in the correct thing. Um, if it was, you know, prefix, ma prefix matching or, you know, exact matching, I would never buy anything on Amazon. Um, but if I type in like <laughs> giant, you know, giant penguin flotation thing, um, you know, that's, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm doing that right now. Right after this call, I'm doing it. You know, that, that's where, you know, like Elasticsearch and, and a search index or an inverted index is a really good, um, you know, use is a really good tool for that use case because it, it has the ability to do fuzzy search and bring things up that I don't know the exact answer, but I, I know close. Regzex is good when you know, you know, the leading end of or the leading part of a string and you say, hey, I just want to know, if, you know, if a string starts with these seven characters um, you know, but beyond that, doing fuzzy search and, and stuff like that, Elasticsearch is, is a better tool um, for that. So that's what we see even in Dynamo and DocumentDB, like a very common use pattern is, you know, OLTP workload to change streams or, or DynamoDB streams over to Elasticsearch. That's a very repeatable pattern. Absolutely. You know, you just made me think of something. One of the things I like to do sometimes is use the I'm feeling lucky button on Google. And I wonder why Amazon doesn't have that for the search bar. I feel, I think that we should write up a suggestion and, and like, if I want to search for a big floating penguin thing and just click I'm feeling lucky and get whatever the first thing is, like, you know, it's a it's an instant purchase of whatever the first search result is, you know, I think that we should have that on the website. That'd be awesome. I would enjoy that. I would. I would. I'd partake. No, I'm going to go write a PRFAQ after this. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Good. Well, we're out of questions. We're out of time for today. Again, two weeks from today, the Dynamo, uh, Document DB virtual workshop, November 19th, 8 a.m. Register now. And our next episode will be on December 3rd, 2020. Same bad time, same bad channel. I'm your host, Chad Tindall. I've been joined by my co-host, Joseph Fitzjork. And thank you for watching today. We'll see you in a month. Thanks, folks. Appreciate the time. Bye-bye.